Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, your local technical consultant with Altium. And today we are gonna be answering some of the best new viewer questions that we've gotten on some of our recent videos. So you guys have been sending in a lot of questions on some of the recent videos about S parameters, impedance, routing with differential pairs, stuff like that. So we're gonna look at those questions today because some of them are pretty darn good. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is on one of the Lee Ritchie videos from a few years ago. Let's take a look. Siva Prakash writes, impedance will change based on frequency in a PCB? Yes, the impedance is actually a function of frequency in a PCB. If you just look at the typical square root of L over C equation from transmission line theory, that theory assumes that the resistance and the dielectric losses are negligible. But in reality, both of those quantities change with frequency. The resistance change is due to the skin effect, which is a function of frequency, and the dielectric constant is always a function of frequency. So yes, in general, the impedance of a transmission line will be a function of frequency. Our next question is a question about the propagation delay through vias and some of the capabilities in Altium Designer. The Lemon writes, will Altium ever support the automatic addition of via delay into signal length tuning? The most frustrating thing about length tuning in Altium using propagation delay in picoseconds versus length in millimeters is that Altium treats all vias as having a zero picoseconds delay. So you are correct that the uh, signal traveling through a via will have some propagation delay and it's not necessarily the same propagation delay that would exist on the actual track connecting to the via. So there is an effective dielectric constant for a signal passing through a via and that dielectric constant is going to be different from the effective dielectric constant on the surface layer or the standard dielectric constant on an internal layer. So it is correct that yes there will be some difference however for slower speed signals, you don't really need to worry about it. This is generally going to only matter at higher speed signals. Will Altium ever include it? Well, that depends. The problem is that you need to know the Z-axis dielectric constant, meaning the dielectric constant seen by electric field pointing along the Z-axis, as well as the dielectric constant pointing along the transverse axis. So we talked about this a bit in the back drilling video, and you can actually look at that video to see exactly what the effective dielectric constant is that determines the speed of a signal traveling through a via. We'll also do a video specifically on this question coming up soon. All right, our next two questions come from a new viewer, Yusan. Welcome to the channel, and I apologize if I've said your name incorrectly because I had to get it off of Google Translate. But I want to look specifically at your two questions around routing with differential pairs and odd mode impedance because they were asked on the same video and they are related to each other. Yusan writes, what is odd mode impedance and why exactly is it that when we use a differential signal, we can have such a small width in the track? So both of these questions are related. The reason we can have such a small width in the track is because the two tracks that make up the differential pair are actually being used as references for each other. So they provide a very similar function as, as a ground plane. Remember, a differential pair carries equal and opposite polarity signals. And what that means is that the two signals are referencing each other on each side of the pair. So instead of needing a ground plane to set the impedance of each trace, the impedance of each trace can actually be set with the other trace as long as they are brought close enough together. This is what allows you to route a differential pair without a nearby ground plane if you want to. Now this isn't always the best practice because when you're trying to route the two traces together as a differential pair, the characteristic impedance of the trace when it is very close to the other trace in the pair will not be the same as the odd mode impedance. So there's an odd mode impedance and a characteristic impedance, and they are not the same thing. The odd mode impedance is just the impedance of one of those traces when the other trace in the pair is nearby and driven differentially. If you were to take that trace totally away from the, the individual trace that we're thinking about, that individual trace would have an impedance that would be the characteristic impedance. So the nearby trace modifies the impedance very slightly and gives it the odd mode impedance. Our next question comes from the podcast that we just aired with Heidi Barnes from Keysight. Let's take a look. Mr. Semper Fidelis 225 writes, great subject and video as usual. I use beads with a resistor in parallel. This gives me low DC resistance for the DC power delivery and it gives some better attenuation at high frequency. He then goes on to ask, 
Any comments on this practice? Am I completely disrupting the point of using a bead when I use a parallel resistor? The answer is that you probably are missing the point of using a bead if you're also putting in a parallel resistor. This is kind of a way to get around the high resistance of the bead at high frequencies by putting a lower resistance element in parallel, in this case, a resistor. So the whole point of the bead is to block high frequency noise from reaching a very low speed load or from reaching a non-reactive load, purely resistive load. And the reason for that is you don't want to create new noise when that load on that blocked rail switches and tries to pull in current through the ferrite bead at very high frequencies. The reason is that the high impedance of the bead at high frequencies around about a gigahertz, that can actually create a new noise problem that is only solved by either one, removing the bead or two, adding a lot more capacitance. So my opinion and the opinion of many others is you're probably better off just avoiding the bead altogether unless the load is purely resistive. So now let's take a look at some comments and questions on some of our recent S-parameter videos. Dr. Tronic writes, worth to remember that this black box DUT should be a linear circuit in the steady state to use S-parameters for analysis. Yes, you are correct. S-parameter theory does assume that the circuit is linear and that all transients have decayed to zero, meaning the circuit is operating in the steady state with just a harmonic excitation. So meaning a pure sine wave excitation. That's the entire point of S-parameters is to analyze circuits that could be very complex, although they are operating in the steady state at a particular frequency. So there is a version of S parameters, which are actually called X parameters. And there's an entire theory around using these that applies to nonlinear circuits. For slowly varying circuits, you could modify the S parameter theory to address time variant circuits, as long as the variation in the circuits is very slow. But for very fast varying circuits, where any of the parameters in the circuit are varying quickly, S parameters no longer apply. So S parameters only applicable in linear time invariant circuits. We got another great comment from our new viewer, Yusan, on this new video. I still do not understand why the diagram does not actually represent a typical two port block diagram where there will be signals on the lower terminals as well. Why is this? So this is one of the things that always confused me about S parameters when I was first trying to learn them. If you look at the typical block for a two port network, it looks something basically like this. By two ports, what we really mean is this port and this port. These are the ports, but it looks like there are four ports here. The reason we always put this is to say that this is our reference or our negative terminal. You could think of it like that. Essentially, it's our ground plane. And that means that if we wanted to, we could maybe, you know, put a resistor across these two terminals if we like. This is not meant to necessarily show a terminal where a signal enters or exits this network. It's just meant to be the ground reference. Really, the ports in this, you know, hypothetical block diagram or hypothetical network are up here and right here. All right, we have another question from one of our super fans, Mustafa Yeti. Mustafa writes, one word, wow. While my brain is on, a video explaining how these S parameters are obtained would be great because I'm confused about whether we need a prototype for measurement by VNA. Do you mean S parameters from simulation results? So in that video about back drilling, you could get those S parameters from simulation results or you could get them from measurement. Remember in that configuration where your via is creating a problem that can be seen in the S parameters, the via is essentially acting as a stub. So because you asked about obtaining these through measurement, we actually now have a Libre VNA. This is a small VNA. It only goes up to about six gigahertz. However, it's good enough to actually take some interesting measurements from interconnects. We're gonna be doing some videos with this bad boy pretty soon. So keep on watching because I am going to have a lot of fun using this and introducing how you can actually get some S parameter measurements. So our last question is not really about signal integrity, but still interesting nonetheless. Mirali Krishna writes, how to calculate the trace width for the pulse high current, like 100 amp pulse current for 20% duty cycle. Okay, so what you're asking about here is what trace width or what power rail width do you need in order to support a pulse that has 100 amp peak with 20% duty cycle. Well, 
you should actually look at the average current at any given moment because the average current is going to determine how wide that rail needs to be. So the average current in this case is gonna be about 20% of 100 amps, assuming a square wave pulse, or in this case, 20 amps. So a good rule of thumb, about 100 mils per 10 amps is okay. 100 mils per 10 amps would give you about a 200 mil wide trace or about a quarter of an inch. If you're unsure and just wanna look at a general case where you might have a heavier copper or you might have a very thick board, what you should do is actually start with the IPC 2152 standard. Now, one thing you should know about IPC 2152 is that this standard is overly conservative. It actually can over overestimate the trace width that you need by a lot. So be careful with using that standard. Just note that that is going to be an upper limit and you can generally go below that. Now we talked about this with Mike Jopi in one of the recent podcast episodes. If you wanna watch that podcast episode, check out the description. We've got a link there. You can go listen to his remarks about this important standard because it is overly conservative and I think it can provide some bad guidance at times. All right, everybody, this has been a fun, short little Q&A session. Please keep sending in your questions to youtube at altium.com. Not altium at youtube.com, send them into youtube at altium.com or you can leave your questions in the comments section. I love getting your questions. You guys are also sending me questions on LinkedIn. That's totally fine. Keep sending them to me on LinkedIn. I love getting your questions and I try to get to them as best as I can. All right, everybody, thanks again for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that like button and definitely don't forget to call your fabricator.